Thank you. Uh, hi again. My name is Manuel Matusevic. Uh, I'm a front-end developer from Vienna and I work for the city of Vienna. I'm specialized in HTML, CSS and web accessibility. That's what I do uh, for a living. I also write JavaScript, some JavaScript, uh, mostly vanilla. And um, I'm also a freelancer uh, on top of my work at the city and I consult usually larger companies and I do workshops um, about web accessibility and CSS, mostly. Uh, a few years ago, I conducted an experiment in 2019 and I wrote an article about that experiment and I want to present the results of this experiment today to you. Uh, let me just quickly share my slides. I hope that you can see the title Perfect. slide. Yeah. Yes, great. Okay. So uh, the experiment or the article was called Building the Most Inaccessible Site Possible with a Perfect Lighthouse Core. Since we have some beginners here and some non not front enders, uh, let me just quickly introduce Lighthouse to you. Lighthouse is a built in tool in Chrome DevTools. So if you open DevTools in Chrome, there is a tab or a pen, yeah, a tab called Lighthouse, and there you can perform certain uh, tests on a website. So you can test the performance of a site, the sec security to some degree, uh, SEO, and also web accessibility and some general best practices. And uh, yeah, this, this, this talk is kind of about this tool. Yeah, so um, I conducted this experiment, I wrote an article and last year I decided to turn this article into a talk and that's what I'm going to present to you right now. What you can see on the screen here is a fictional tweet by a fictional uh, Twitter user and it says, yes, we did it, all green and party emojis and below the message you see a screenshot of Lighthouse, uh, this built-in tool in Google Chrome and there are four categories, performance, accessibility, best practices and SEO and for each category you see the score 100. This is how Lighthouse works. So you get a score between 0 and 100 and if you get 100 it means that you've passed all the tests. And for a second I want you to think or try to imagine or think what you feel when you see someone post something like that on social media. Or maybe you have uh, already done that as well. Maybe you have posted something like this. What do you feel when someone uh, posts something like that? Just, just think for a second. I will tell you what I think. When I see something like that, I think that's awesome. Because this person didn't just build a site and put it online. No, they built a site and then they tested it. And they probably didn't get a perfect score. So they did some optimization and they tested again and optimization and testing up to the point where they got this perfect score. I don't know if you've ever tried to get a perfect performance score in Lighthouse. It's pretty hard if you don't have a website that just, you know, that's just HTML. But if you have a site with JavaScript and images, that's pretty hard. So it's a Good thing uh, if someone shares their achievement and is proud of their achievement. But there is also some criticism because there are people who say these numbers are in fact just numbers. Just because it, Lighthouse says that you have a perfect score uh, in performance doesn't mean that you have a fast site. Or just because you have uh, a score of 100 in accessibility, it doesn't mean that you have a perfectly accessible site. And this is also valid. So for me, it's both. It's great to share your achievements. Uh, you should be proud of your work and share it with the world or at least with your followers. But also understand that these numbers are just numbers. My friend Zach, he posted in back in 2019, he said, free blog post idea, uh, how to build the slowest website with a perfect lighthouse core. And obviously, I really liked that idea. And I started thinking, okay, how can I build a website that, had, that, is, that is really slow, but it still passes these performance uh, tests? So I started thinking and tried to come up with some things. And then Vadim, my friend uh, from Russia, um, he posted, that would be a wonderful read. Uh, here's one for an accessibility audit. And next to his message, there is an image tag with a source attribute that says picture PNG. And uh, this image also has an alt attribute with the same value, so picture PNG. And this would pass a test because the image has a description, that's fine. But the description just doesn't make any sense because it's the file name. And of course, I even like that idea even more. So I started thinking, I started experimenting and testing, and I came up with uh, this page 
and uh, also with uh, the corresponding article. And this is a page that I built to test my, uh, uh, or, or to, to test the things that I wanted to, to, to implement in this experiment. And what you see on the screen is a page with like a basic page with some paragraphs and uh, some list items. There's a link, a heading, and a simple form. And if you ask me, this page is perfect. It's, it's, it's just a perfect page because it's super fast. It's fast by design. There is no CSS. There are no images. There's no JavaScript. It, it doesn't get faster than that. Uh, it's compatible. It will work in all the browsers. It will work uh, on the uh, portable PlayStation that Constantine mentioned. It will work uh, on, on Nokia phone. It will work in, um, I don't know, Opera Mini in extreme mode and also in Lynx, this uh, terminal-based browser. I don't know if you know that. Just like this full-on text browser in the terminal. And of course, it's also accessible because I'm using semantic uh, HTML. We heard about that in uh, Constant Stock. And there is no fancy new HTML here, just basic stuff that has been around for a while. So this page is super awesome. And this is the baseline for my experiment. So I took this page and I tried to make it as inaccessible as possible without Lighthouse noticing it. And I'm going to show you how I did it and what I did. But there are two important disclaimers. First of all, this talk is not about Lighthouse, and it's also not about Xcore, uh, the engine that powers Lighthouse, and it's also not about any other testing tool. Um, I, I like these tools. I use them almost every day. This is really not about these tools. This is about you and me and about uh, uh, web developers and how we interpret these numbers uh, that testing tools give us. This is the first uh, important thing. And the second important thing is, that this talk is highly sarcastic. I already mentioned that earlier. So all the things, pretty much, I would say 98% of the things I'm going to say are not true. Like it's just sarcasm. It's just over exaggeration to, to prove a point. That's just something that I want to make sure that you understand. So I did a lot of testing. I did a lot of experimenting. I um, tried all kinds of things to make this work. And as you can imagine, I learned a lot about web accessibility. So this isn't just a stupid experiment and, and uh, my way of trying to be an asshole. Uh, it's, it's just a, 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 a great way of learning stuff. So I learned a lot about web accessibility. I learned a lot about web accessibility testing. And I actually learned so much that I was able to come up with my own web design principles and web development principles. You might have heard of graceful degradation or progressive enhancement. Forget all about that. The hardest shit and the, 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 the only principle that you need is a new thing called progressive degradation. This is what I came up with. And if you apply progressive degradation to a website, you make sure that with every line of code that you write, you make the experience for your users worse. And this is what we're going to do. I'm applying progressive degradation to this perfect page that I just showed you. So let's do it. Let's, let's, let's uh, get started. Um, I want to get to, to start by warming up a little bit. We web developers, we love complexity. We love to use Webpack and to configure Webpack. We also love to use uh, JavaScript, JavaScript frameworks for pretty much anything that could go online. So we love complexity and I want to add complexity to this very simple page. And I'm doing that by uh, putting the hidden attribute on the body element. Now, I have to say I could stop right here. So if I put the hidden attribute on the body, all the content on the page is gone because hidden in HTML is what display none is in CSS. So the whole page is gone. If I run a lighthouse test, I get a perfect score and that's it. But that's too easy to me. And I made this rule for myself for this experiment. I technically still want to show something uh, on the screen. So just using hidden or visibility hidden or something like that wouldn't work for me. But I will still keep these attributes. Uh, the, the thing that I'm doing right now is that I'm adding a style sheet to this document and I'm putting the loaded class on the body element. And within this style sheet, I'm setting display to block on the body element. The page still looks the same, but now CSS is a dependency. So if for whatever reason CSS doesn't load, the content won't show because the hidden attribute is in HTML. And if there is no CSS, there is no content. Now I know what you're saying. 
uh, wh why why would that happen? Who who why, why why wouldn't CSS not load? It happens actually quite often to me. Um, for example, if you're in the middle of nowhere in Italy or in Greece and you're trying to check something online, you want to book a, a ferry or whatever, uh, you're happy if just anything makes it, makes it over the wire. Uh, so if the if the connection is really unreliable, it might happen that CSS doesn't load and you, that you only get the HTML. But okay, I know it doesn't. This doesn't happen too often. So let's add some more complexity. So instead of putting this loaded class manually on the body element, I'm going to do it in JavaScript. So I'm adding a JavaScript, of course, a render blocking JavaScript in the head element, and in this JavaScript, I'm uh, selecting the body and I'm setting this class. So now. In order for a website to work, JavaScript needs to work as well. If for some reason JavaScript doesn't load or if the user decides to not uh, allow JavaScript in their browser, no class, no content, uh, no class, no CSS, no content. Pretty awesome. Uh, we've just, with a few lines of CSS and uh, JavaScript, we've added complexity to our site. Let's just Let's just run it first. Let's, let's just see what happens. So I'm in Chrome now. I have uh, DevTools open. You can see the Lighthouse uh, panel. I've only selected the accessibility test and I press on generate report. And Lighthouse now uh, needs some time to warm up. It checks the page. It runs some tests. And as already mentioned, it runs uh, some of the tests that also X DevTools run. And yes, you can see perfect score. Of course, that was easy because, you know, um, we didn't do anything too, too bad. Most websites need CSS in order to work. Most websites need JavaScript in order to work. So this is fine. But I would say this was just a warm up. Let's get dirty. Let's get really dirty. Let's start by excluding screen reader users. Constantine showed us how to make sure that they're included. Now I want to exclude them as quickly as possible. Now, there are different ways to exclude screen reader users. So you can use some of the ARIA roles that Constantine mentioned and uh, use them in a very wrong way. Um, or you can just use divs for everything. But the easiest way that I found is uh, using ARIA hidden. We just saw that in the button example with this uh, equals sign or whatever that was. Um, Constantine used it to remove it from the accessibility tree because it doesn't convey any meaning. And I want to use the same attributes to you know, remove the whole page. So I could just put the aria hidden attributes on the body element, but I'm smart. I know that uh, there is a test in Lighthouse that checks if the aria hidden attribute is on the body. So it seems like people like to do that. So they included this test. My workaround is simple. I just wrapped the whole uh, content of the page in a div and I put the aria hidden uh, on this div. This is fine for Lighthouse and this should also be fine for uh, my experiment. Constantly mentioned the accessibility tree. I just quickly want to explain the accessibility tree and what it is and how it works. Um, or actually, I don't know how it works. I'm, I'm, I'm not that well into the accessibility API and stuff, but uh, here's a, a simple explanation. If you write an HTML document and you open it in the browser, the browser constructs the so-called DOM. You've probably heard of the DOM. DOM is a representation of your HTML document and it contains all the elements that you've added to the uh, to the document and all the child items and some properties. And you can also modify the DOM by using JavaScript, for example. And the browser also constructs another tree, which is the accessibility tree. It's similar to the DOM tree, but it on only contains information uh, relevant and necessary for assistive technology. So it also constructs a tree with elements and child elements, but it contains information like the accessible name and the role. We saw that in, in DevTools. And if you use aria hidden on an element, you are removing, removing it from the tree. So putting aria hidden on the body or on a, uh, uh, another parent element removes the whole element and its children from this tree. So um, two lines of HTML and I've excluded all screen reader users. Pretty awesome. Um, I'm going to run a test and see if this is fine. It should be fine. Why wouldn't it? So, hmm. Okay, it says 94 and it says area hidden true elements contain focusable descendants. Okay, ah, fine. So the problem here is I can use area hidden on the div, but the problem here is that I have focusable descendants. We've learned earlier that some elements are focusable and others aren't. In my specific example, it's the link at the very top and it's the input field and the button. These are focusable descendants and 
Lighthouse doesn't want me to have a parent element with ARIA hidden that contains focusable children. I can fix that. So let's look at the first element, the, the link. The link is focusable by default. So um, on the screen is a link element, an A element with the href attribute, basic HTML stuff. Um, and I've seen a workaround from this on many real websites online, and I'm going to just steal that pattern from other sites. So instead of the href attribute, I'm using the onclick attribute and location.href. It pretty much does the same thing. So you click on the link and it redirects you to this page. The difference here is that an A element without an href attribute isn't a hyperlink, it's a placeholder link. So an element where a link might be in the future or where the link might have been. Um, just imagine you have uh, a website with a member area and it says member area, but you can't click it because you're not logged in. So um, only if you're logged in, you can turn this into a link. And if you're not logged in, it's just, a, not, just, just, just an element. Uh, the, the great thing here is if a link doesn't have an href attribute, it's not focusable. So this fixes the issue for the first element. Then we have this form. And in this form, there's an input field and a button. Uh, Constantine said, a div is not a button. I highly disagree. I can easily turn this button into a div. The div is a much better element here because it's just easier to style it. And I can also turn the input field into a div. The only thing that I have to consider with the input field is that you can add content, but I just add the content editable attributes. And by doing that, I make it editable. So users can add text in this div. Um, of course, if you're using divs for everything, you have to provide styles. So I would have to provide the styling for the input field and also the our fake link doesn't look like a link. So it's not blue and it doesn't have an underline. We have to add this styling in CSS. But other than that, it's perfect. Now, <clears throat> I know what you're thinking, especially the experienced uh, developers among you. You're saying, I don't know, man, this doesn't sound like a very sustainable solution because uh, what happens if you have a Visivik field? We talked about content management systems earlier. What happens if uh, an editor adds a link? You can't just manually turn this into a fake link or what happens if someone adds another focusable element and you are right this isn't really sustainable this isn't dry code so instead of doing that you can also just use javascript so in this uh well, let's call it plugin that i wrote you select all the focusable elements on the page in this example i'm just selecting the input the button and the a but you would have to extend it with all the other focusable elements uh, that could be in a page. I'm looping through these elements and I'm using the tab index attributes and I'm setting it to minus one. This means that these items are still focusable via JavaScript using the focus method. But if you press the tab key, you can't focus them. And this is much nicer. So if there's any focusable element on the page, you just can't access them. Pretty nice. So let's see what happens. I run Lighthouse again. And perfect. So uh, our, still, our page still looks the same, but now we've ex excluded all screen reader users and Lighthouse doesn't complain. Let's, let's deal with the next user group. Let's deal with keyboard users. Excluding keyboard users is pretty easy. All I do is I select all the items on the page in their focus state and I set outline to none. This means that um, if they use a, key a keyboard or a switch device, they won't see where on the page they are. Let me give you an example. So uh, I will just I will show you a video here with uh, my page. And the first part, in the first part, you will see how it looks like if you have custom styling. In the second part, you will see how it looks like if you have no styling. So if I press the tab key on this page, you can see there is a salmon colored outline around the link and the input fields. And if I remove it, nothing happens. You don't see where on the page you are. Or actually, if you look closely, you can see in the input field, the carrot blinking. So it shows that you are in the input field. And this means that you can actually still access the field, but you just don't see where you are. And I don't like that. That's not exclusive enough for me. So I'm using JavaScript again. I add an event listener, a key down event listener to the document, and I just prevent default on everything. So if a user presses any key, just nothing happens. 
I just prevent the default behavior. And I have to say, the beautiful thing about progressive degradation is that if you're working on one thing and you're trying to make the experience worse for some users, at the same time, you might fix or unfix uh, it for other users. So in my testing, I discovered that by doing this, you can't press command or control plus or minus. So you can't zoom the page anymore. And this excludes another user group, which is just amazing. All right, uh, let's run a test. Let's see what happens. Um, this should be fine because I've done it a million times, uh, like re removing the outline uh, in the past. So just like Constantin, I've, I've also built a lot of inaccessible websites. And yes, perfect score. So uh, we've excluded screen reader users, keyboard users. And now let's deal with a very privileged user group with mouse users. Excluding them again is easy. I select all the items on the page in their default state and in their hover state, and I set cursor to none. Cursor none to mouse users is what outline none is to keyboard users. So they can still use the mouse, but they just don't see the cursor. This is one way of excluding mouse users. There's another way. Uh, it's called the Buck Offset. It's a technique uh, coined by my uh, good friend, Max Buck, and it works like this. So you take a cursor, the default cursor, you open it in an image editing tool, and then you change the width of the, the, the image. You uh, increase the width by 100 pixels. You align the cursor to the right, and then you save that image. And you use this image in your CSS for all the items on the page. And in this image, um, the, the hit area is always on the top left. So in the, in the invisible part, but the actual cursor is 100 pixels to the right. And what happens is that users think that they're clicking one area of the page, but actually they're clicking 100 pixels to the left. And this is just really, really evil. Uh, he came up with that, so I named it uh, with his name. And you can see an example here. There's a paragraph with some links and three buttons. And as I'm hovering the first button, nothing happens. And when I hover the second button, the first button shows hover styles. If I hover the third button, the second button shows hover styles, and so on. So this is just really, really annoying. But at some point, your users, some at least some of them who are like uh, really smart, uh, might discover that they can still click stuff and they might uh, understand what's going on. So this is bad. We can improve that by just using point events, uh, the point events property in CSS. And if you put that on the body and set it to none, it uh, removes all the, the point events. So it means that users can't click anything on the page. I mean, they can click, but nothing will happen. And point events is a property that will be uh, inherited to child items. So this is really nice. And if you really want to exclude as many people as possible, if you really don't care about your users, you might want to use a polyfill. So if you want to make sure that this works in as many browsers as possible, you can use this polyfill I wrote. Uh, this polyfill checks if the point events property is supported. If yes, it just returns. Uh, if not, it adds a click event to the document and again, prevents default just like our key down event. And you know what? Actually, I like this technique much better because CSS is just, just such a weak language uh, and JavaScript is in a much stronger language. And instead of using CSS, I would just use JavaScript in the first place. Um, and this brings me to the second principle I came up with. So next to or uh, besides uh, progressive degradation, I also came up with the rule of most power. And the rule of most power says for any given task, always use the most powerful language. So for example, if you want to add a paragraph to a website, don't use the P element in HTML, use Canvas in JavaScript. Okay, let's run another test. This should be fine. And fingers crossed, awesome, 100 still. Okay, so let's just quickly uh, do a recap. We have excluded screen reader users, keyboard users, uh, people who need to zoom in and uh, mouse users, awesome. Now, <clears throat> the beautiful thing about the web community uh, or the web development community is that if you want to create bad experiences for your users, there's always someone in the community who will help you to make the experience even worse. 
For example, Alvaro posted on Twitter, mobile users can still select the text and copy paste it uh, somewhere else to read, assuming they still have the energy to deal with the site. To avoid that and make the content even more inaccessible, remove user selection for all elements. What a great tip. So um, I take this advice from Alvaro. I select all the items on the page and I set user select to none. This means the text can't be access, uh, can't be uh, selected anymore. I mean, it wouldn't work on desktop because we've set point events to none and so on, but on mobile, it would still work, it seems. So this makes sure that uh, also uh, users of smartphones and tablets and so on can't select the text on our page. All right. Mm -hmm. The next thing is really interesting. So um, next, I want to deal with pe people, people who need um, high contrasting colors. In Windows, there's a thing called uh, Windows High Contrast Mode, and this allows you to change the default theme in Windows to a very high contrasting theme. So on the screen is Windows with uh, black background color and uh, outlines are white and the text on the page is yellow because I've set the default theme to a very high contrasting dark theme. And this is especially helpful for people with low vision. The cool thing about Windows high contrast mode is that we can actually target it in CSS. There's a media feature called MS high contrast. And um, in this media query here, I'm uh, selecting all pages or actually all Mm, browsers uh, that are currently in high contrast mode and then I can add some specific CSS just for people who use high contrast mode and I could do something like that so I could just select all the items on the page and set the color to black because you know the background color is black and if I set the text to black it's black text and black color and you don't see anything on the page anymore. The problem with that is that there aren't just dark high contrast themes, but also light ones, or people, uh, users can actually also select the colors they want for their high contrasting theme. So this would work for some users, but not all of them. So again, it's not exclusive enough for me. But what's awesome about CSS is that in CSS, we have different ways of defining colors. There is the hex code that you can see right now, there's RGB and HSL and so, and there are also keywords like blue, red, brown, and there are also system colors and system colors map to specific parts uh, of the user interface. So if I select, set color to window, it will always match the background color of the website. So if the background color is blue, color will be blue. If the background color is black, color will be black and it looks like this. So this is our website uh, in high contrast mode with my, um, let's call it improve improvements. And all you can see are the outlines of the button and the input fields. Everything else is just black. And this is just so, so evil. I actually expected that Facebook now Meta will knock on my door and try to hire me, but they never uh, got in touch. So I guess it just wasn't evil enough for them. Nah. Anyway, uh, let's let's just run another test and see what happens. Um, this should be fine. Why would anyone care about high contrast mode? Awesome. All right. So our website isn't interactive anymore. You can't use the mouse, you can't use touch, you can't use the keyboard. It's not accessible in high contrast mode, but you can still read the content. And as I already said, I didn't want to make it too easy. I didn't want to use display none or hidden or visibility hidden or opacity or any kind of absolute positioning or whatever. So um, I decided to go with this. I select the body and I set the opacity to 0 0.03, which means that Technically, there is still some content on the page. I don't know if you see that, but there are some shades of gray that you can see here. So technically, there is still content. So let's do a final test, and that's it. We're done for today. This should be fine. So Lighthouse is running. Ah, damn it. 94 again. It says background and foreground colors do not have sufficient contrast ratio. So here's the thing. Back in 2019, when I did that, it worked. It worked perfectly fine. And I like to believe that they fixed it because of me. I mean, at least Google people got in touch with me and they, they were really mad about my article. Um, so maybe, maybe they did it because of me. I don't know. I like to believe that they did it because of me. Anyways, uh, so using opacity doesn't work. Also using uh, color white on white background doesn't work. Lighthouse uh, detects that stuff. And at that point, I was, I was sitting at home and I was thinking, damn it, 
how can I fix that? I, I, don't, I don't know how to do it. If I can't use opacity, what else can I use? And here's the thing. I've been a web developer for now more, almost 13, 14 years, something like that. So I know my CSS. So I tried some things and I uh, tried the following. I'm using the filter property and the blur method. And I'm just blurring the text. You can see that I'm now increasing the value from zero to one two, three, four, up to a point where the text is so blurry that you can't see it on the page. So I tried that and then I ran another test. And you will see now that I get my perfect score again. So the filter property works for Lighthouse. And while I was using the filter property, I discovered that there is also a opacity function that you can use with filter. So one way of dealing with this, let's call it a problem, would be to use blur with a very high value or to just use the opacity function here. So if we use that, it will be fine. Now, I don't know why this works. So I uh, went ahead, I went on GitHub and uh, I found the X uh, core repository and I actually filed this as an issue and told them, hey, I tried the filter property and opacity function and it doesn't, it seems like X doesn't discover that stuff. And they said, yes, we know filter is complicated. Can you tell us uh, like a practical example where this was an issue? And I was like, nah, I just did this stupid experiment. I have no idea if this is actually like a real problem. And they said, if you, if you discover it like a real problem, please post it here because dealing with filter is much harder than dealing with opacity in CSS. So there is a reason why they weren't able to fix it. And as you can imagine, my article... Um, you know, costs some uproar. So almost all of the major testing companies contact bit, contacted me in some way. And also the guys from uh, Wave, and they also uh, asked me about the tests that I did and I also talked to them about this. And they said, yeah, it's just too complicated to, to deal with filter. Anyways, uh, if, if you stumble upon uh, like actual issues with the filter property, then please uh, report it online somewhere. Okay, so uh, content is technically not... Uh, visible, but my audience or the audience of my blog is very tech savvy, you know, web developers, they know how to find content. They know that they can right click and, and uh, select view page source and just read the content on the page. So I also dealt with that. I took the codes and I turned all the content into HTML entities because I don't believe that anyone can read entities fluently. And now if you look at the source code, you also can't read it. Yes. That's it. And um, why did I pick Lighthouse? Well, I picked Lighthouse because Lighthouse is the most uh, most well-known no tool, I would say, because even if you're not in the web accessibility, you might know Lighthouse because it just ships with Chrome and uh, you might have seen the accessibility category while you were performing performance tests. So this is why I picked Lighthouse. And I also picked Lighthouse because it was a little bit easier than uh, testing with X tools, uh, X dev tools, because even though they're both using the same engine, uh, Lighthouse only uses a subset of the rules that X dev tools uses. So it was a bit easier. But for this article, I tried to use uh, dev tools again. So I opened my dev tools. I um, oh, sorry. I went to the X dev tools tab and I scanned the page and there was only one issue. And the issue says page must have means to bypass repeated blocks. So they want me to add a heading or a landmark region or a skip link. No problem. I'm adding a skip link. Here's a skip link. Uh, it points to an ID that doesn't exist. I'm using CSS to hide it from the screen for sighted users. And of course, I'm setting tab index to minus one so that I don't have issues with the, with the very first thing that I showed you with ARIA hidden. And this should be fine. Now, if I run another tool called Wave, it's also one of the more uh, well-known tools. It's uh, built by the guys from WebAin. Constantine mentioned that. It says that there is an issue, and the issue is um, broken skip link. So WebAin is a bit, uh, Wave is a bit smarter than X tools. It says there is a skip link, but it's broken. It points to an ID that doesn't exist. No problem, I just put the ID on the skip link itself. So the skip link is referring to itself and now this should be fine. Let's do another final test. Perfect. Zero errors in wave, 
uh, zero errors in DevTools and a perfect Lighthouse score. Oof, I know that was a lot and uh, there was also a lot of sarcasm and um, also uh, mixed with some actual, you know, good advice, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, why did I do that? I did that to like prove a point or to really outline that these numbers that you get from automatic testing tools are in fact just numbers. So just because a tool says that your site is accessible, it doesn't mean that it's actually really accessible. If you get a perfect score or if you get zero errors in X dev tools, if you try it out, then your journey doesn't end there. It starts there. This is where the real testing starts. This is where you take your keyboard or like Constantine said, where you throw away your mouse and you start testing with the keyboard. You uh, start testing with, uh, I don't know, zooming your page in or with screen readers and so on. And only if you do that, then you can get to a website that's close to being accessible. There is no perfectly accessible. This just doesn't work. Uh, but um, using automatic testing tools and in combination with manual testing will get you as close as possible to accessible. Again, this is not about the tools. I'm a big fan of X dev tools and Lighthouse and Wave. I actually really use them almost every day. It's about you and me and how we interpret these numbers. If you um, want to uh, experience this talk again in written form. Uh, it's on my blog. It's called Building the Most Inaccessible Site Possible with a Perfect Lighthouse Score. Just a talk. Um, yeah, just Google it. You will find it or duck, duck, go it. And that's pretty much it. Thanks so much for watching. Um, I'm on Twitter as M. Matuso. Matuso. Currently, I'm taking a Twitter break. So don't contact me. Don't contact me there. I have a website, matuso.at. And I'm also on Twitter with my a second website called HTM Hell, and the handle is HTM underscore Hell. Thanks a lot.